But we want to talk a, bit, a little bit about Chile and this and this uh, loss for the new constitution um, in in the country because this was something that we had all put a lot of hope into. Um, you can find clips of of Matt and I in 2020 talking about how excited we were about this process and this moment, and we need to talk about where we came from and see where we are now so that we can start to plot um, a, a direction to the future. Now, it's still very fresh. We don't have all the information. There's more analysis that is needed. So, of course, this is going to be incomplete. But just because something is difficult and complicated doesn't mean that we shouldn't wrestle and reckon with some of the contradictions and tensions and try to draw out some lessons. But maybe just to set the stage a little bit, Matt, if you're if you're able, like, could you explain to people what the Pinochet like constitution was, why it represented such a, you know, cementing of, of right wing power people. I'm sure who listen to this program are familiar with who Pinochet was military dictator who came into power after the coup against Allende, um, who was, you know, a Marxist who was popularly elected, um, in, in, in Chile. And then you saw this horrific right wing reaction to dictatorship that lasted, um, you know, for a very long time and still has many of its echoes, um, in the current system today. Um, but you know, one of the, the one that is most notable is the Chilean constitution, which is one of the most right-wing, um, pro-market, um, constitutions in the world. And I think that it is important for people to understand what people rejected from the outset. Um, if we're going to talk about, you know, some new avenues or new potentials for the future. Yeah. So I'm going to be reading from a book that uh, folks should uh, put in their libraries. It's a democracy in chains by Nancy McLean, the deep history of the radical right stealth plan for America. You know, you'll see, if you Google this book, you'll see a lot of whiny libertarians talk about how it's reductive and um, uh, over generalizes and maybe over emphasizes the emphasis of certain individuals or the, um, the efforts of certain individuals, but it is a very good history for the uh, rough explanations it does give. And there's a reason the libertarians are so whiny about it is because a hit dog will holler. Uh, here's a, from the chapter, a constitution with locks and bolts. So intrinsic was the influence of economic libertarians that Chile's new constitution bore the same name as Hayek's classic, the Constitution of Liberty. It promised a democracy, remarked the leading American historian of the Pinochet era, Stephen Stern, protected from too much democracy. The new constitution guaranteed the power of the armed forces over the government in the near term and over the long term curtailed the, the group influence of non-elite citizens. The document guaranteed the rule of General Pinochet and his aides until a 1998 plebiscite that might extend his term to 1997 when a new generation of stern notes would have learned the role of the citizen in a restrictive democracy. The devil is in the details, goes the adage, and it is true. The wicked genius of Buchanan's approach to binding popular self-government was, this is Buchanan, is the libertarian that McLean focuses on most in this. Um, uh, in the boring fine print, he understood, transformations can be achieved by increments that few will notice, but most people will have no patience for minutia. But the, uh, the kind of people he was advising, I'm going to skip a little bit ahead here. Um uh, Pinochet personally reviewed the penultimate document, making well over 100 changes, then announced that citizens would have to vote a simple yes or no on whether to adopt the new constitution in its entirety and a plebiscite to be held within a month of release. The balloting would take place during a prolonged state of emergency in which all political parties were outlawed, no voter rolls existed to prevent fraud because the junta had them all burned, and no scrutiny or counting by foreign observers was to be allowed. When a group of moderate jurists and civic leaders composed a truly democratic alternative document, the regime prohibited its release. Censorship. That should get some people's attention if nothing else does. Um, the mayor's charge with running the plebiscite and counting the votes owed their jobs to the dictatorship. So that's how we got the constitution that Chile is trying to replace. Yeah. And, you know, again, this is some, uh, a document that really enshrines the power of, of the market, limits the government's ability to do things like nationalize certain industries. Um, you know, a really, really devastating relic of right. author authoritarian neoliberalism. Yeah, I got um, actually some some more on that, David, actually. The net impact of the new constitution's intricate rules changes was to give the president unprecedented power, hobble the Congress, 
and enable unelected military officials to serve as a power break on the elected members of Congress. A cunning new electoral system not used in anywhere in the world uh, would permanently overrepresent the right-wing minority party to ensure a system frozen by elite interests. Mm-hmm. To seal the elite control, the Constitution forbade union leaders from belonging to political parties and from intervening in activities alien to their specific goals, defined solely as negotiated wages and hours uh, in their particular workplaces. It also barred advocating class conflict or attack in the family. Anyone deemed anti-family or Marxist could be sent into exile without access to an appeal process. So, you know, and reminding folks, because I know everybody comes into these conversations with different understandings of, of history. This is a, you know, military U.S. backed reaction to organized socialist movements that were able to win popular power in the country that was then toppled and replaced with a military dictatorship. Um, you know, so all those kind of like anti-public, anti-political aspects of, of the drafting of that constitution um, were very much set up to make sure that people were as far away from the drafting of, of their constitution as possible. But fast forward to today um, or into recent history, there ha- and, you know, since then, obviously, Pinochet is deposed. Um, the country, though, spends years and years and years effectively being controlled by right wingers. And it has led to a country that is highly unequal, um, a, a country where there is mass dissatisfaction with government. Um, and in 2019, there was spark- is sparked this massive social protest movement, one that we covered a hell of a lot on TMBS, um, you know, that was really challenging the austerity and the neoliberal character of the government in, in, in Chile. In 2019, there's this massive protest movement that then embodies itself in this 2020 vote to scrap the Pinochet Constitution. And I'm just going to play a couple seconds just to remind people um, who might have forgotten how jubilant and enthusiastic that moment was. This is from 2020 uh, when the Constitution, the uh, when people voted to scrap the Constitution. I mean, it was it was massive partying, um, you know, in, in, in the streets. People were very excited and particularly the international left was very excited about this this moment. You know, one of the popular slogans of the rejection, uh, the, the vote to scrap the initial constitution was neoliberalism was born here and it will die here. Right. There is no banner um, that can speak more to the heart of you know somebody who holds our politics and something like that. Um, and then since then, um, You know, a leftist, and it's important to note here, not necessarily of the socialist, more communist side of Chilean politics, uh, Boris is able to win the presidency. And during this period of time, the convention is ongoing to rewrite and draft a new constitution uh, for the country. And then this weekend, this happened. Opponents of Chile's new proposed constitution never dreamed they'd win Sunday's referendum by such a wide margin. Some toasted the victory. Others honked their horns, convinced that the charter would have fanned divisions and instability. I think the majority of us want a new constitution, and that must be respected, but it has to be done properly, with capable people. Supporters of the proposed text insist it was progressive and cutting edge. It guaranteed gender parity, social rights to all, allowed abortion and protection of the environment. Yet many others believe it went too far, for instance, by recognizing Chilean indigenous groups as individual nations. Some people, even from the center left, that are voting rechazo or rejection of this text is because they fear that, this, that, this, that Chile will be dismembered somehow. Voting in this referendum was mandatory, but that's not the only reason why this vote will likely be remembered as the one with the highest citizen participation in Chilean history so far. It's an indication of just how much Chileans believe that a new constitution has the possibility of changing their lives for better or for worse. Humbled by the electoral defeat, left-wing president Gabriel Boric acknowledged that the proposal he'd supported was not what the people wanted. I promise that I will do all I can, together with Congress and members of civil society, to present a new constitutional calendar 
using the lessons of this process to deliver a new text that will interpret the will of the people. The referendum has dealt a strong blow to the president, whom many blame for a rise in inflation and crime. People such as Cecilia, who voted against the Constitution. To be honest, I did not read it. Now the process starts all over again, prolonging uncertainty in a country that needs social and economic change, but can't agree on how much. Lucia Newman, Al Jazeera, Santiago. And again, um, the vote was 62% um, against and something like 38% for. Now, <laughs> How do we get here? And like again, like just trying to catch everybody up. Um, if you don't spend a lot of time reading, you know, left media, particularly on the international scene, people really saw this constitution as the embodiment of many, many of goals that are are held by by progressives and the left more broadly. It was certainly a maximalist constitution. It was one that very much um, embodied a lot of these things um, that, that we consider to be rights and or at least to be necessary political goals that are achieved. And again, we're at a moment right now where I think it's important not to overstep our analysis, but I also think it is mighty cowardly not to talk about some of the things uh, that went wrong, especially when the right wing is going to be very, very happy to frame this in a certain way. So how did we get here? There's been a lot of talk about what happened. And one of the most dominant conversations that you're going to get from people on the left or even the center left is about, quote, unquote, fake news. And I'm just going to stop it right there. I'm not saying that's not a problem. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm not even saying it's not influential. But this is one of those things where you can't just sort of sit and say, like, oh, well, the media is against us um, <laughs> and act as if like that is enough. You know, well, then like while we play. Right. Um, that also is a very easy way to sort of reject any kind of attempts to learn from negative results like this. And this was a negative result. I mean, this was a huge setback of a years long process, um, one that had its roots in decades long opposition and pushback uh, to the right wing government and the military dictatorship. Um, so, yeah, no doubt people are going to be talking about fake news, but I think that's a very, very simplistic way to look at politics. And it's also one that doesn't give us any kind of avenues for trying to figure out ways to beat it. Because you can say that there's a lot of fake news or misinformation out there, but then you're still going to be left with the same question. Well, how do we beat it? And the only way to beat something like that is to be able to provide and present a much stronger, much more reality-based counter-narrative, right? The reason the right wing is so committed to using mis disinformation is because they don't have very, very much positive to stand on. So they have yeah. to sort of stoke fears and play this game. Also, not a new strategy for them. So it's not something that like, especially just capital and liberal, even liberal capitalism, making it up as they go along. Like this is tried and true, right? Like it's it, it's honestly like the playing fields as, as favorable as it's ever been with regards to misinformation. Maybe that's a, maybe that's too categorical of a statement, but like the capitalists have controlled media. Right. Like that's that's a thing that's happened. Um, th and the technology's changed a little bit to be a little bit more inclusive. But it, like you said, like this is this is the this is the race we're trying to run. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't know, it just reminds me of, of um, <laughs> something that Vera Farka said to Haddad when he was in, in New York after losing to Bolsonaro, where he was blaming fake news um, and, and, and Pentecostalism. And, you know, uh, Vera Farka, I think had a very good response to that, which is like, you know, we're the left. We actually can't be the people who are losing in technology. And again, it's not saying these things aren't happening. They're not, it's not saying that these things aren't things we should take seriously. But this is one of those kind of excuses that becomes all too easy and becomes way too dominant um, and, and, you know, and misses a lot because there were problems uh, with the drafting of this constitution, as we'll talk about in a little bit. I don't know if you have this handy map, but like, here's how the right's trying to frame, um, you know, yeah, this rejection. Um, this is in the FT, our favorite paper. Um, Chile's rejection of populism is an example for the world. In Sunday's constitutional referendum, voters spurned a flawed vision of utopia. 
Uh, populism has cast a particularly long shadow in Latin America. Crowd pleasing orators oh, proclaiming a new utopia pepper its recent history. I don't know how much I need to take you all through all of that, but you know where this argument is going. Um, in this unpromising landscape, uh, Chile's decision in a referendum on Sunday to reject a decisively an impossible utopian constitution stands out as a remarkable example of civic maturity. This is a setback for left wing president uh, Borch. The former student protest leader who had staked much political capital on the now rejected radical draft. Voters were almost literally promised the earth. The draft would have granted constitutional rights to nature. Alter um, attractive looking carrots abounded among the 388 articles drawn up by a specially elected assembly after a year of sometimes raucous debate. So that's how the right is going to try to frame this. This is why left-wing politics don't work. This is why appealing to the people doesn't work. Uh, we have to be grounded in reality, which means a very, very pro-market conservative outlook on politics. Um, but again, as I was saying earlier, I think a lot of the left-wing reactions to this have been equally um, you know, unsatisfactory for trying to figure out why this, um, this, this vote failed. I highly suggest, and if you just put up the title for a second, Matt, um, I highly suggest uh, people read the piece um, translated roughly into where did the support for the Ch Chilean constituent process go uh, by Noah Teitelman, if you're able to uh, find a way to read that. And he outlines yeah, it's on uh, Nueva Sociedad. Thank you. Um, he outlines three particular reasons. One was the spectacle of the convention. And, you know, for some people, they might know this. For some people who aren't familiar, they might not. You know, people were elected to be in this convention and there was a lot of spectacle aspects. And we'll get into some of the reasons why, but, you know, from costumes to grand pronouncements and denunciations of certain groups. I mean, there was a kind of spectacle performative nature to this whole process. Um, there was also a very clear over over representation. This is um, what Tuttleman argument uh, arg argues. There's an over representation of the left that was not necessarily in line with the social base of the country. And three, he also, I think something that a lot of lefties would agree with, uh, notes that there was a reaction of dominant groups in Chile to marginalized groups, most notably on the question of plurinationalism, um, you know, with multi-nation system um, and largely independent indigenous court systems, which a lot of people um, rejected, many of them um, for more conservative reactionary reasons. Um, but others uh, for, for different ones, right? And it's worth noting, and this gets into the, the defeat, that you have to remember that the vote to scrap the constitution initially in Chile was a rejection of the political system as a whole. And remember, like just like in the United States, when you see people sort of saying, I'm rejecting politics in this country, I'm rejecting the elite, that can have a hell of a lot of different kind of connotations. And sometimes misrecognizing that as, oh, these people are sort of aligned with us is a little bit of a mistake. Um, so it was a rejection of not just the constitution, but the political system um, in, in Chile and most notably the major parties in the country. Um, to draft the constitution, there was a people's assembly that had mandated gender parity and indigenous representation. Uh, Non-party candidates were able to coalesce together uh, to be voted for in blocks. And the right was not very well represented. They lost their elections, right? Losers there, sure. Um, but when this gets brought back to the people, there becomes a, you know, attention here. The right was very underrepresented and independence. Um, and what I mean by this as a non-affiliated with a party, though the vast majority of them were left leaning, were highly represented. And the convention was, there was a lot of it that was spectacle, uh, spectacle. There was a lot of activacy, um, aspects to it. Um, you know, costumes, there were people who were nude um, in certain votes. I mean, things like that, that certainly turned off average folks. And there were also very serious maximalist and performative demands that were put forward, even on things that were scrapped. It just sat, felt, I th the argument is that it felt to a lot of people that this wasn't representative of the people of Chile rather than a very mobilized group of folks. Um, it's it's re worth remembering too, um, that the looseness of political parties and party identification have waned dramatically in Chile. Uh, the performative nature of the convention made it seem like these drafters were just as out of touch with the people as politicians. Um, and it also doesn't help. This is tension, right? This is dialectics. Because uh, Borch, the, the president, had run so closely with this new constitution 
there's also an aspect here that a vote against the Constitution is a vote of dissatisfaction uh, with the current government. Um, polling has shown, though, that the most unpopular aspect of the Constitution by groups like Espacio uh, Publico uh, Ipsos, um, some of the most unpopular aspects of the Constitution was the plurinational state. Um, particularly the creation of indigenous justice systems. And there were lots of attempts to try to work around that, potentially allowing the Supreme Court to overrule these systems. But this was something that was a real sticking point when people were asked what their opinion was on the Constitution. And it's something we have to reckon with. In the campaign, um, you know, the, the vote was sort of in the campaign for voting yes or no on the Constitution political parties did reemerge. You saw the traditional parties of the left align more with for the constitution and the conservatives against. So remembering all of the factors that go into this, you see this popular uprising against the system. You see this new kind of attempt at democracy to sort of create a people's uh, assembly to draft a new constitution. So like based a lot of it based on this kind of rejection of party politics, it then gets brought into party politics when it comes time to, for this um, vote. It's also very notable, too, so that we get this right as Marxists, that rejection was strong across class basis. I'll say that again. Rejection was was strong across class basis. So you can't sit here and say rich people went one way, poor people went another. Right. There are lines here. Some went further than others. But across the board, um, if, if you look at the, the economic data, people rejected this from across different kind of class categories in society. Um, a poll that was also cited in that piece by Noah Teitelman, um, which was done by Cadam, found that 17% of the respondents declared themselves in favor of rejecting the Constitution in its entirety. 35% rejected it with the intention, um, were in favor of rejecting it with the intention to restart the process. 32% of Chileans um, said that they would have been voting to approve, to reform the constitution after the fact, that is after it had already gone into place, and only 12% approving outright. Right. Um, so there's some key lessons here, right? One, rejecting outright only got 17% of the vote. So there is popular demand here for a new constitution in the country, and that process is going to be underway, and we'll have more on that as it gets developed. So the question that the left has is how to um, reform those who want a new constitution, how to form those who want a new constitution into a majority. Very likely, there's going to be a fast-tracked attempt to redraft this constitution. So what should we do and what should we learn? We could talk about the spectacle nature. We can talk about some of the, the kind of symbolic aspects of politics that might have turned off you know, the average voter, right? I think that's important, but I think that that's also more of a question uh, for people in Chile. Um, and to... I'd also say that can't be the 25% loss, right? Like just that stuff isn't going to, isn't going to make you get walloped by that much. Certainly. And like, this is the point is like, there's a, this is why a lot of people have avoided wanting to talk about it because there's a lot of different factors in play. And this isn't the final analysis of this. Um, but I also think it's very dangerous to say we're going to reject, like really trying to look here and to see what kind of tensions uh, we're going on because this matters not just for people in Chile. This matters for us across the globe as we're trying to find ways to get our message and our ideas into practice rather than just sort of sitting on our bookshelves in the realm of theory. Um, so this is not about wagging the finger, but without a doubt, it shows that the only real way to win is through organization and building class consciousness. That's sort of it. Like it, it could just end there. There's no shortcut around politics. And this is not me sitting here saying that people who are involved in this process, people who are advocating for this new constitution, which is something that I supported. I had some issues with some parts of it, but I generally support it. Um, it's not saying that people involved in it weren't considering this either, right? In the same way that people in our country, um, when we were trying to elect Bernie Sanders, all knew that we needed real organization. We didn't have it, and we tried to find a way to do it without it. This is just another one of these hard lessons that the left on a global level is learning is that like you just can't fast track that process of building class organization, of building class consciousness. Um, but it also brings in a tension that I think really does exist on the left, um, not just in Chile, but if you think about here, where it's just like this fetishization of spontaneity. 
right? Because in the days as it was going on, as as the initial vote happened, and then as the council con- convention was sort of unrolling, you had all this. Well, this is wonderful. There's spontaneity. There's all these different groups, and they might not all agree, um, but maybe we'll get something positive about this, right? And that was oftentimes cited as a positive thing. Like this is the expression of the people in a myriad of different ways. And as you see from some of the rejection of, you know, some of the aspects of spontaneity that went into the People's Assembly there, um, you know, spontaneity can have a real negative effect. You won't be able to skip the social process of challenging and educating people on the embeddedness of some conservative elements in our politics and our ideology. And we also really need to be careful about confusing maximalism with socialism or even with the more squishy concept of leftism. These are not the same things. And it's really damn important that we get this right because there are demands that we have. There are ideas that we have for the society um, that we want to be living in. But we have to remember that politics and particularly socialism is a process. It's not just like a one set of like clearly outlined uh, policies yeah. that we just enact day one done, right? Yeah. The other yeah, thing- yeah. I, I, the way I think about that is like it's something you, we have to like cultivate, especially through state policy. And it's not something that all of a sudden we just turned the state into, uh, right? I, I totally agree. And like um, I, cultivating is the word, right? Like the goal of like socialist politics and policy more than anything is actually creating like that that space and that environment where um, working class people, class consciousness, these kind of um, class rooted, embedded organizations and consciousnesses can truly thrive and grow. But here's the other thing that we really cannot do, right? Because I think some people are mad for what I've said just then, but there's this other group that's also extremely dangerous too. The other thing we cannot do is be reactionary, right? Oh, this or that was rejected by the people, so we should drop it outright, right? Gender, like gender, um, positive like gender politics in chile were rejected so drop that from the left right we need to just do a hard nose you know wages up um capitalist down only politics right no social aspects to it Um, we're gonna drop that that is reactionary and that is also the wrong analysis don't put your head in the sand and refuse to recognize that some things are not popular at this moment um, and also that some things are not well thought out in their implication and their pra- and putting them into practice, but also don't solely react to this or that and overdetermine and essentialize people and essentialize things, right? Because all of these fights, particularly in the social arena, are processes. It doesn't mean it needs to take 15, 20 years. It doesn't mean it needs to take generations, but these are things that, um, you know, these battles, they, 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 they need to be rooted in a movement that can get the victories that are necessary to get the kind of final victory that we want. Politics is a process. It's chaotic. And it's our job as socialists to see where people are, but also be to committed to the ideas um, and, and, and the belief that we can move people over to our side. So just because it's not there today doesn't mean it's not worth fighting for for tomorrow. And there were some very laudable things in the Constitution that was proposed, and there were a lot of others that felt very much premature. We also have to be recognized that we must be rooted in organization because the idea that spontaneity is going to be able to win it, that spontaneity has the long-term outlook necessary, the energy necessary of doing the things that we want to do is wrong. It's tough. I'm sorry. But we have to organize class-rooted movements and not just hope that circumstantial, eclectic coalitions are going to be able to sustain the ongoing and coming right-wing attacks. There's going to be a lot more um, to see what the the movement um, next is going to be. I think one thing that's really important to reject and to start um, pushing back against is the idea that, okay, well, this um, constitution was too far, was too progressive, all this, so we should draw all of it back, that we shouldn't try to get victories and cement certain things um that's where the fight is going to be because there's going to be a big push to say like constitution was too crazy we're just going to take on like a slightly less conservative version of you know a typical constitution in other south american countries right that's where the fight is going to be uh, coming up and we need to really reject that kind of idea say okay the kind of maximalist super progressive you know 388 article constitution might not be uh, something that's viable in the short term, but also don't overreact and say, we need to draw this all back completely. I'm looking forward to talking um, to friends and people who are actively organizing and, and, and pushing on this. Um, but I think that, you know, as somebody who was a big supporter of this process, who had a lot of hope for it 
and it's been very devastated by this defeat. I think it's really important to be sober eyed about some of the lessons here. Don't become a reactionary, but also don't become so starry eyed that you, you can't see where some politics and some strategies failed. Uh, and I would just emphasize, you know, these things haven't been done before, right? Like uh, the American constitution was written. Well, we, we just went over how the last Chilean constitution yeah. was implemented. The American one was just a bunch of slave owners and some Northern merchants, right? Like that got together and they were only able to agree on a, like less clauses than that. So like just, this is uncharted territory and it's not, a, it's, it's, I don't think it should be, anyone should be, um, uh, sort of uh, shamed for you know pushing this for as maximalist Absolutely. as it can, but you have to understand that that is a strategy, and does that strategy deliver the goods? As far as like trying to cultivate a world where regular people have a little bit more power on their side, um, and you know maybe pair it back um, because it's yeah, like you said, like it's it's a lot easier um, when you're just like you know a few uh, fancy boys who own slave plantations in Virginia. Exactly. And last thing I'll say on this before we move on is I'm a socialist. I'm a Marxist. I'm not a progressive. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not a leftist. Yeah. I think that those terms are very squishy. I don't know what people mean when they say these things. And I think some of the lessons that we've been learning on, people might have seen, we did part one of our documentary on what was left populism. Part two is ongoing, um, hopefully be out in the next couple of weeks. Um, I think what we've learned from this chapter of left populist politics is that there is a promise of uh, initial kind of mobilization that could come around um, some of the, some of these ideas that were sort of put forward in left populism. Um, but un un unfortunately, we've seen that those don't have uh, the long term resiliency and the ability to commit people for a prolonged period of time to think strategically into the future to be able to deliver in the way that we desperately, desperately need. Um, but there'd be much more on, on all of that in, in the future. And yeah, we'll definitely be covering this more. I definitely am looking forward to getting um, some more folks on to sort of help us understand, particularly people who are more familiar with the, the political and social landscape um, in Chile, who have, have more experience with this, and particularly people who are working on plans, um, you know, to make sure that this defeat doesn't end in a total defeat. Um, that, that there is a victory that is very close and, and on the horizon. So much and more. You are it you pointed out like the type of the, there was like people who want a new constitution, but rejected it. And people who thought like this one wasn't really it, but still approved it anyway. That was what two thirds <laughs> of Chileans, yeah. right? Like that, that that's really the lesson here is like the right will run with it because that's what they do. They try to take advantage of things where they can try to declare victories, but this is definitely not that. And time only is moving forward, I think, in this regard. Like, I mean, may, it would let's just say this. The worst case scenario is somehow the right is able to exploit this and turn their 17 percent or whatever the fuck into let's just go back to Pinochet. But I think we should have a little bit more faith in Chileans um, than I expect think that's we should happen. have a lot of faith. I mean, the, there is no doubt about it. that There is a desire for a new constitution in the country, a popular one. Um, and we need to just be able to find ways to write it. I mean, like. Um, we might not clip this because this is just like a, a general point, but I, I think I was saying this to you, Matt, or somebody else. It drives me nuts whenever something like this happens, right? Um, both defeat and victory where people overdetermine results. Like, oh, with this election, people voted this way, and this election, people voted, you know, differently. Like, you know, in, in Austin, for example, there was like an attempt to radically um, slash the police budget in the city, um, and it won by like a pretty wide margin. Very soon after, there was another public vote um, that criminalized homeless people in a way that is so draconian and so anti-human. And sometimes it's hard to walk around and remember that folks, you know, were voting for that kind of thing. I bring that up to say it's like you can't say one of these things is more determinate permanently than the other. Right. Like we have to do analysis. We need to look at things and learn lessons from them. But this kind of desire to say like, oh, this is that's the final vote. Now this question is settled. This is the final vote. Now this question is settled. You need to be looking at things from a much longer perspective. Right. And, you know, the the attempt to um, redraw and redraft the Constitution. Chile is, is part of not only like a long process in, in Chile, but a part of like a long term global kind of left populist social progressive movement to really fundamentally change the way that people are treated um, in countries, not just Chile, but across the globe. Right. 
And we need to learn some of the lessons and, and, and failures here. And I just really get frustrated uh, when something like this happens and people say like, this is, you know, the, the final analysis of this. It's like, I think it's right. very important to draw lessons from it. I think that it's also important to be able to stand up on your own two feet a little bit and not say like, well, it's all complex. So I'm not going to have any opinion on these things. Um, yeah. But this other kind of like very quick reaction to be like, all right, that's that question settled, right? People feel one way about this uh, permanently, uh, right. I think is wrong as well.